Hello, uh, my name is Ignacio Melero. I uh, work at the University of Navarra Clinic. I'm responsible there for uh, the immunotherapy program, both uh, in research and in clinical practice. My job here today is to uh, uh, address um, biomarker uh, discovery uh, efforts in immunotherapy of cancer, a very challenging task. And also, um, I will be covering immunotherapy of renal uh, cell carcinoma. Um, these are uh, my disclosures. And actually, there are many things you can measure in a cancer patient trying to address uh, whether the patient is going to benefit from treatment. In a way, the simplest uh, dichotomy would be things that you can measure in the patient and things that you can measure in the tumor. And we have many tools. We can go to DNA and uh, uh, genomics. Uh, we can look at the messenger RNAs that are expressed. Actually, we can look at the microbiome, uh, not forgetting that the immune system is highly regulated by the flora, the microbial flora. Uh, we can check uh, parameters of immune function, both uh, in peripheral tissues or, or in the tumor itself. We can use several tools of proteomics, and we can look at the epigenetics of the tumor, and all of those factors are going to really affect whether immunotherapy works or not. The problem is that this makes it very complex, and we certainly want to know what are the most predictive factors. Um, probably more than one factor affects a lot. This is multifactorial. So maybe we will do our best to assess the uh, um, uh, propensity to respond to immunotherapy by measuring uh, several parameters. There is a, a review by Christian Blank in Science that I uh, do recommend to uh, address this multifactorial uh, uh, scenario and in a way, they used a kind of um, a, a, a geometric figure whose area is going to reflect the likelihood of respond. And several factors are plotted around uh, this uh, immunogram, as he uh, 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 referred to it. And one of the factors is tumor foreignness. We will go through it. The other one is whether the tumor is already infiltrated by immune system cells and what's the kind of immune cells that are there. Then the presence of the targets for the immune therapy treatments and the presence of the so-called checkpoints in the tumor. But there are other factors such as the microbiome, then uh, there will be metabolic factors and, and also inflammatory mediators that we would like to measure. As I am mentioning, this is getting more and more complicated, but for clinical practice, we need to make it simple. Uh, and simplification is often uh, an oversimplification, but never forget that as um, uh, it goes in the proverb, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication of complexity. And actually, the role of many investigators now is to re really identify what are the meaningful factors. So the first one I'm going to refer about is tumor foreign, foreignness, defined as the uh, mechanism that provide uh, an Im the immune system with a target to identify the tumor and distinguish it from normal tissues. T cells recognize antigens in the form of peptides presented by uh, self uh, HLA uh, antigen presenting molecules. For HLA class 1 molecules, this presentation happens because of uh, peptides coming from the transcriptome of the cell are loaded onto the binding cleft, uh, uh, peptide binding cleft of HLA class 1 molecules. If you look at this uh, um, representation of the molecule, from uh, the top of the cell, you can see the peptide in red and the antigen presenting molecule depicted in a white and blue. And how do these peptides come onto these uh, um, uh, antigen presenting molecules? Well, it's kind of a sophisticated pathway. The, the idea, and probably you know very well, is that the proteasome is constantly degla degrading uh, misfolded proteins uh, in, in the cytosol 
and 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 it, uh, it um, uh, breaks the proteins into uh, peptides of uh, different sizes, some of which are pumped uh, into the um, uh, um, in the plasmic reticulum by specific transporters. And once there, with a system of chaperones, they are loaded on this binding cleft of a nascent uh, HLA uh, class one molecule which is mature in the Golgi and eventually uh, comes to the cell surface where it's presenting kind of uh, the whole array of peptides fitting this uh, uh, class one uh, antigen presenting molecule. And for evolutionary reasons, uh, this locus, uh, which is expressed in a codominant uh, fashion, is highly polymorphic. By that, I mean that many different alleles can occupy each of the loci, that in the case of uh, uh, HLA class 1 molecules that present antigens to cytotoxic T lymphocytes are the locus HLA-A, HLA-B, and HLA-C. And as you can see, they can be uh, occupied by quite a few uh, different alleles. The reason for such a diversity is that uh, they have evolved in humans and in apes in order to accommodate the most common pathogens. And there is a survival advantage if you can present a, a dominant antigens from prevalent a, pathogens. But this complicates a lot the life of transplanters, but also of tumor immunology. An important thing to bear in mind is that if you look at the binding cleft of uh, uh, HLA class 1 molecules, there are several areas that are uh, fitting amino acids of the peptides. Uh, those are the so-called pockets that accommodate the lateral chains of some of the amino acids in, in the peptide. And, and because of that, there are patterns of uh, uh, peptides that can accommodate uh, this binding cleft. Uh, these are usually, depending on the HLA molecule, eight uh, to nine amino acid uh, long uh, peptides. And uh, interestingly enough, when proteomic people started to elude these peptides and sequence them, they realized that they were shared patterns in such a way that suggested that you could make predictions of which peptides could be eventually accommodate a, a class one molecule. As you can see here in the picture, there are these anchoring uh, uh, amino acids represented in, uh, um, in orange that are actually uh, common in the many different peptides that are eluted from a given HLA class 1 uh, molecule. And, and tumors, to uh, be tumors, need to have uh, mutations. And mutations uh, would potentially give rise to antigens, to an antigenic determinants presented by HLA class 1 or class 2 molecules. Whether point uh, mutations that are non-synonym in, ter in terms of protein sequence, deletions, insertions, would give rise uh, to uh, sequences that are not present in the uh, normal uh, transcriptome of the cell and thereby can give rise to uh, peptides, but not uh, antigenic peptides, but not always, only when they do fit the endogenous repertoire of antigen presenting uh, molecules. Um, uh, problems with RNA splicing or even epigenetic problems can eventually give rise to uh, uh, potential uh, antigens. Ooh. So whenever a mutation happens, uh, it can uh, be antigenic for a number of reasons. One of them is that it will result in an a, a amino acid that is not present in the native sequence, that it's phasing out and it can be recognized by uh, uh, the uh, antigen T cell, the T cell antigen receptor. Um, uh, Differently, it can also generate uh, an amino acid or a set of amino acids that would fit better with the uh, antigen presenting molecule, thereby giving rise to a neoepitope or a neoantigen. And then if the mutation is more complex, uh, uh, several of these things can happen together. But those are the basis for antigenicity in tumors. The interesting thing is by the group of uh, Ting Chang in the uh, Memorial Sloan Cater in the in Memorial Sloan Catering Cancer Institute, it became clear that uh, the more uh, mutations a tumor had, in this case in metastatic melanoma, 
the more likelihood to clinically benefit from a checkpoint inhibitor, in this case blocking CTLA-4 uh, uh, with the antibody ipilimumab. But not only mutation burden, if now they apply algorithms to predict the likelihood of these mutations to fit with the HLA alleles present in the genome of the patient, then the correlation with survival became even more clear. So it's possible that the main factor linking uh, 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 antigenicity with tumor uh, uh, burden and prognosis uh, or predictive um, uh, value for um, immunotherapy is related to the number of epitopes that are actually, the new epitopes that are actually presented by tumor cells. Uh, this seems also to be true for non-small cell lung cancer. The pioneer group uh, work by uh, Dr. Ritzby in this regard showed that there was a correlation of uh, the clinical benefit from pembrolizumab in these uh, patients depending on uh, the mutation burden. And again, when uh, new epitopes were uh, predicted in silico, there was uh, a good correlation between overall uh, progression-free survival in this case and, uh, 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 in, and uh, of the patients uh, uh, following pembrolizumab uh, treatment. Interestingly enough, using the tricks that immunologists used to uh, actually be able to see that the patient has T cells responding to these antigens, it was possible to see an increase in the immune response as a result of PD-1 blockade, and it was possible to see that some of the epitopes were uh, new epitopes were actually recognized in the patient because if you got those T cells and exposed them uh, to synthetic versions of the antigen, they started to produce gamma interferon that can be measured by intracellular staining, and that's what these dot plots here show: is that uh, some of these antigens were actually recognized in by larger numbers of T cells uh, in the patients. Another important point coming uh, uh, from uh, the Cree Institute here in London in this uh, paper by uh, McGranahan et al. published in Science is that they used a trick to actually be able to tell whether the mutation was present in all the tumor cells or it was heterogeneous. Is what in uh, tumor genetics they call an stem mutation, which is uh, there probably all the way from carcinogenesis, or what is a branch mutation that is not shared by all the tumor cells. And as you would probably have predicted, those patients in which the neoantigens are in the uh, stem, uh, uh, are in, the, in, in, in all the tumor cells, are more susceptible to immunotherapy than in those cases where there is a, a, a uh, multiple clones of uh, tumor cells expressing different mutations. And this is probably due to the fact that the tum all the tumor cells are expressing are not the antigens, which are ultimately the target of the immune response that we exploit in cancer immunotherapy. Uh, indeed, uh, using these algorithms to uh, predict heterogeneity in the expression of uh, antigens, they could see a nice correlation uh, uh, to tumors. These are not easy biomarkers at all because uh, they presume that you have to do whole exome sequencing of the tumor, a uh, normal tissue, typically peripheral blood, uh, compare them, and then do a lot of bioinformatics in order to predict the epitopes. But if it were uh, a good biomarker, eventually uh, cost of sequencing and of bioinformatics can be dropped, and, and this could be uh, done in the future. Another very important point, and this was uh, realized by uh, Tom Gajewski uh, in uh, the University of Chicago, and also from uh, by Franco Marincola, the NCI, as that the tumors that tend to respond to any kind of immunotherapy, whether vaccination, immunomodulation, whatever, tend to be those that have already an infiltration of T cells in the tumor, in such a way that immune infiltration in itself is very often a prognostic marker, a favorable prognostic mar marker in tumors. But, uh, and this is an interesting uh, 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 trick, what uh, probably immunotherapy does is to unleash 
an immune response that is already, uh, is already ongoing. And unless you have an, an immune response already ongoing, then immunotherapy tends to be uh, uh, not successful. In this way, we can classify tumors at, as uh, hot and as cold. Those tumors that we call cold tumors are tumors that do not have T cells inside. Then we have uh, tumors with evidence for pre-existing immunity, particularly those with a lot of CD8 cells or T cells producing interferon gamma. Those are what we uh, call uh, uh, hot tumors. And then obviously you have a spectrum uh, where some of them are colder than others. And there is something also that we see a lot is uh, the, what we call the excluded infiltrate. And those are tumors with an invasive margin with T cells, while the malignant uh, 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 tissue itself, where the tumor cells nest, is devoid of uh, 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 T cells. And what uh, defines a, whole, a hot and a, a cold tumor? Uh, it's uh, very complex. Um, actually, uh, a lot of the research right now in cancer immunology is trying to address precisely this point because there are factors that are related to the genetics of the tumor, to the epigenetic of the tumors, with the kind of inflammatory response that it's there. And, and actually, it would be kind of very difficult to generate a, a very good algorithm uh, to predict uh, a these. Things are getting very complicated, uh, as you can see here. And if you consider all the functions that you need for a successful immune response, virtually, you could be uh, uh, measuring all of them and trying to figure out uh, uh, whether or not uh, this is uh, giving rise uh, to an effect on uh, immunotherapy. But at the end of the day, what has been already been successful is that we know that checking the transcriptomic signature of genes that respond to interferon gamma correlates with propensity of response there are several signatures that have been validated and patented, and they are routinely used. This is simple because it's a simple uh, macroarray that can be done. Then the evidence for activated CD8 T cells, if they have the molecular means that they use to kill, such as perforin or granzyme B, and then the type of macrophages that are uh, inflammatory and are producing uh, um, a, a kind of the right type of mediators, such as TNF-alpha. Those are what we call uh, M1 uh, macrophages, and they are typically elicited also by interferon gamma, and they are nice guys uh, for immunotherapy, as opposed to what we call M2 macrophages, which are producing uh, angiogenic factors and growth factors, and the kind of inflammation driven by IL-6, for example, that uh, it's not uh, a myeloid inflammation, that it's not good for uh, immunotherapy. Obviously, uh, in a, a population of cancer patients, uh, we get uh, these parameters in different fashion. It could uh, have kind of a bell-shaped curve, and, and some of them are uh, more uh, uh, propensed to immunity, some of them more uh, to tolerance. Genetics, age, the microbiome, the presence of previous viral infections, uh, the exposure to carcinogens, the exposure to... Ha uh, uh, the, all that uh, uh, defines uh, uh, this uh, uh, propensity. And then uh, it's very multifactorial. But the methods that we typically use to uh, uh, analyze all these are conventional immunohistochemistry. We are learning now that it's much better to have more than one parameter, uh, more than one parameter information in the tissue section. And for that reason, multiplex immunofluorescence techniques are becoming uh, widely uh, used. And actually, they provide a lot of information. And since fluorescence is better than chemistry in the re in, with regard to quantitative uh, measurements, immunofluorescence can provide semi-quantitative uh, um, assessment of the uh, uh, level of expression of the different proteins. Using uh, RNA-seq or, um, or different forms of RNA expression techniques of uh, multi uh, multiple genes in a single run are also very important. And as I mentioned, and mainly because of 
uh, analyzing the foreignness of the tumor, the, the number of uh, mutations, and, 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 their, um, and their likelihood to give a rise to new epitopes, we use whole exome uh, uh, sequencing. And, and, and we are trying to learn also whether there are uh, genetic or epigenetic features of the tumors that are mediating this immune exclusion, something that has a lot to do with the vascularization of the tumor and the time of microvasculature that it's uh, in the tumor. A very interesting uh, suggestion came again also from the uh, group of Tom Gajewski, and, and that comes from the fact that cytotoxic T lymphocytes, uh, CD8 T cells, typically to, uh, uh, to get them turned on, you need uh, to present antigen with a very uh, interesting subset of dendritic cells, of antigen uh, presenting cells, or professional antigen presenting cells. This small subset is characterized by expressing by, uh, the transcription factors uh, uh, BAT3 uh, and, and also uh, IRF8. Uh, and, and, and in a way, what we have uh, learned more recently is that at least in melanoma, but probably also in many cases, uh, in the TCGA, it comes uh, 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 a very interesting feature is that hot tumors tend to be richer in this particular subset of CD103 uh, dendritic cells than those who are not. And, and, and even then, you could see uh, hot tumors in red, uh, cold tumors in, um, in uh, blue here, and, and you, you set your cutoff in the middle. And, and it's interesting because this correlates better with the presence of these uh, professional antigen presenting cells for CD8 cells than actually the, the mutation burden that is represented here in the upper graph. So it's, it's probably uh, uh, the case that it's not only uh, 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 gene uh, mutations that make tumors recognizable by the immune system, but also, and importantly, the presence in the tumor of these uh, 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 antigen presenting cells. And actually, those tumors which are immune deserts that are not populated by uh, T cells are probably primarily devoid of these antigen presenting cells in the uh, infiltrate. We don't know what's uh, first, the chicken of the egg or the egg, but this is a field that is going to be very active in the next uh, uh, five years. An important practical uh, knowledge is that B7H1 is another name for PDL1, and the presence of TILs can be combined together. And, and by the different uh, combinations, you can get uh, four phenotypes, one, two, three, and four here. Some of them, which are deserts, do not have PDL1 or tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. Some that have PDL1 but not TILs, those that have uh, both of them expressed and and some of those which only have TILs but not PDL1. And, and this is probably a very important thing because we can personalize treatment for each of these uh, uh, subsets of patients. Those who have an immune response going on and PDL1 is there probably blocking the response are going to be those patients who will, uh, are more likely to respond as opposed to the immune deserts where probably we will have to do something else in order to get an uh, immune response against the tumor, something like vaccination or echo treatment that would enhance uh, uh, this infiltration by immune system cells. So uh, I guess that now you are going to watch uh, this video about PD-1 and PDL one blockade from a molecular perspective. In recent years, immune checkpoint blockade has taken centre stage as a significant breakthrough in medical cancer therapy. Activation of T-cells involves several paired molecular interactions, such as T-cell receptors, or CD4, with the major histocompatibility complex, B71, with CD28, and several others. Programmed cell death 1, or PD-1, is a member of the CD28 superfamily and is expressed on T lymphocytes. PDL1 and PDL2 are its ligands on cancer cells. Mechanistically, T cells use PD1 to probe cancer cells for PDL1 and PDL2. When they find it, they leave tumor cells alone to survive. 
When PD-1 binds to its ligand, it induces immune suppression in the tumour microenvironment, which subsequently leads to resistance of cancer cells to the immune system. However, when a molecule blocks this identification, T cells are no longer misled by the presence of PDL1 and PDL2, and subsequently rally an immune system attack on the cancer cell. Antibody-based PD-1 or PDL1 blockade has achieved strong success in clinical trials. These agents take advantage of specific binding to antigens and thus have been widely used for immune checkpoint blockade. Multiple PD-1 or PDL1 antibodies have been approved for clinical use or have entered into clinical trials, including nivolumab, pembrolizumab, atezolizumab, dervalumab, and avelumab. The first clinical trial of a PD-1 blocking agent began nearly a decade ago in patients with blood cancer. Today, more than a dozen trials have been completed, with more than 50 underway, involving thousands of patients with several different types of cancer. These ongoing trials are encouraging, particularly since they indicate that a substantial number of participants have benefited, resulting in a need for further trials. Additionally, they have suggested that these agents may be effective against multiple types of cancer. Having seen that video, it becomes uh, important uh, to know whether the tumor is expressing PDL1, whether there is PDL1 expression in what we call the tumor microenvironment. And there are several agents blocking either PD1 nivolumab, pembrolizumab, or, um, um, or uh, PDL1 such as atezolizumab, uh, durvalumab, or avelumab. And it's not easy at all to detect PDL1 expression on a formalin fixed and paraffin embedded tissue. There were many attempts, many uh, uh, cases of failure, to generate good antibodies staining this moiety in the tumor tissue. And there are several issues about epitope retrieval, then the folding of the protein, and, and other factors that makes this very, very difficult. In such a way that the companies developing uh, these compounds have invested heavily in uh, developing or buying reagents that would reliably uh, quantify the number of cells that are expressing PDL1 above a certain cutoff. Um, uh, these companies have uh, uh, developed their antibodies and automatized the detection and, quantific, uh, uh, and how you uh, quantitate the, the number of, uh, of cells. And you have here several antibodies, uh, 288, uh, 22C3, SP142, and SP263. And, and importantly, since uh, the, the, these compounds are being developed at, in the same period of time, it has become very important to uh, actually uh, be able to compare what's the result with the different uh, antibodies. It is also very difficult to have the pathology departments running all the tests and all the platforms for, for detection. Um, in most cases, uh, um, the technique is only taking care of expression or with a surface pattern on tumor cells. And then you quantify a brown cell and, and cells that are not stained, uh, and you uh, end up with a percentage of expression. There's one exception, is that uh, the uh, atezolizumab being developed by uh, Genentech, they were uh, more interested in checking not only the expression on tumor cells, but also on immune cells infiltrating in the tumor, since they found a, 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 a correlation with uh, the uh, likelihood of uh, a response, of objective response to atelosidizumab, at least in uh, some uh, uh, types of tumors. In this case, uh, they generated a score depending on expression in tumor uh, and expression on uh, uh, tumor cells. And then they studied different cutoffs in the different uh, studies using it as a predictive biomarker. As you can see in several uh, uh, um, attempts to uh, 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 see the, the consistency of a staining with the different compounds, you can see that uh, uh, most of them uh, have a nice correlation. One of the problems is in the 
in the in, in the in the steepest uh, part uh, of the curve of correlation where very little differences can can mean a lot and probably is where the cutoffs are and in the case of sp142 uh, it disclosed uh, less positive cells but remember that this antibody was uh, generated probably mainly to detect expression on immune uh, uh, cells this is how the thing looks like so as you can see, it's uh, uh, not that easy. These are typical examples. So when it is 100% of the tumor cells, it's easy, but then it becomes a little bit uh, uh, less cumbersome because staining is typically patchy and tends to, uh, um, to uh, concur with the areas where T cells are. And one of the reasons for that is that the main inducer of PD-L1 expression is a interferon gamma, which is a cytokine produced by tumor infiltrating lymphocytes if everything is going okay. And then the predictive value as a biomarker uh, after this complex detection uh, in the pathology department um, is uh, good, but it's not uh, great. Uh, by that I mean that you can enrich for patients who would uh, eventually respond uh, to PD-1 or PD-L1 blockade. But as you can see, depending on the disease, this level of enrichment is uh, twofold in the best of the cases. And that's probably not enough to negate treatment who, to people who have uh, no other um, uh, uh, treatment with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, known uh, efficacy. So uh, we really need to get better and beyond uh, PDL1 staining uh, in the tumors. Um, and again, we go to this uh, nomogram, uh, trying to see what else we can try to plot together in order to have a better picture, knowing that the complexity is uh, a great. And there is something which is emerging as very, very interesting. And that's the presence of bugs in the gut, um, potentially also in the skin. As you know, the microbiome is a huge collection of uh, bacteria that uh, 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 nest in the, uh, uh, in the gut, uh, especially in the, in the colon, and, and with many species, and that we know for a long time that they regulate immunity quite a lot. In fact, it's a species specific as well as a, a healthy presence of uh, bacteria giving rise to um, um, important components in the pathogenesis of uh, uh, autoimmunity, for example. In fact, the gut microbiome could be not only a um, prognostic or predictive factor for immunotherapy, but also potentially a predictive factor for immune-related uh, toxicity in, in cancer patients, because there are many mechanisms in, that are regulated by the presence of some uh, 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 components of the microbiome that go uh, to the level and degree of uh, infiltrate in the tumor and are governed by controlling the function of the dendritic cells at this level, but also uh, systemically. Uh, if you are curious about this, uh, I, I, I do recommend uh, some uh, reviews, including one by Lawrence Bohill and Tom Gajewski, who were the pioneers showing in mice that uh, the microbiota actually regulated the immune response uh, against um, a, a cancer. And not only the basal immune response, but also, and importantly, the response to PD-1, PD-L1 blockade or to CTLA-4 um, blockade. Another important issue is resistance. Um, immunotherapy is not going to be an exception to other cancer therapies. Uh, tumor cells can develop resistance or be resistant uh, to begin with. Um, resistance in uh, tumor cells can be present in all the tumor cells in the tumor mass. Uh, maybe some clones will adapt. Maybe um, uh, at the end of the day, you could have a very, very nice response, but persisting cells would ad adapt. And the molecular basis for these are only being started to be studied. 
This is mainly because immunotherapy was not very effective for a number of years. And it is since uh, the first decade of uh, the 21st century that we are achieving some degree of efficacy, mainly in melanoma, that now is tending to other diseases. So in the absence of efficacy, we did not uh, uh, worry that much about acquired resistance. And resistance, um, and this field has been pioneered by the group of Tony Rivers, of Tony Rivers in UCLA, can be primary depending on genetic and epigenetic features of the tumor. For example, several oncogenes make the tumor less, uh, um, less likely to be inflamed, to be uh, hot. But uh, tumors can escape also by downregulating the antigen presentation machinery that I introduced to you at the beginning of the first part uh, of the lecture. For example, downregulating uh, uh, the, mo the molecules needed for antigen processing and loading, and importantly, the antigen uh, 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 presenting molecules itself. In fact, HLA class one uh, molecules are stabilized, they, are, they need to be stabilized by a protein called beta-2 microglobulin, which uh, assembles and stabilizes the complex. And the in the absence of beta-2 microglobulin, there's virtually no HLA class one molecules on the cell surface. And in that setting, a complete loss of beta-2 microglobulin would give rise to a tumor that is invisible to CD8 T cells and thereby would provide an escape route. HLA class one molecules are typically expressed at a very low level. And only when there is type 1 interferon or gamma interferon around where there is uh, uh, signals that are denoting a viral infection is when these gets expressed uh, at a logarithmic scale, several logs of increased expression. So precisely, this pathway of uh, signaling from the interferon gamma and the uh, type 1 interferon receptors are, uh, can be down-modulated by mutations or some kind of uh, uh, epigenetic adaptation. And if that happens, there will be a much uh, uh, decreased level of antigen presentation in the tumor. And that's precisely which seems to be a major route of escape precisely in melanoma. Uh, the type 1, uh, uh, and in this case the interferon gamma receptor, uh, it relates on two uh, uh, um, tyrosine kinases that get associated to the cytoplasmic tail, JAK1 and JAK2, that activate the STAT1 uh, um, uh, and, and STAT2 uh, transcription factor that relocates to the nucleus uh, after phosphorylation and regulates many genes, including, importantly, HLA, MHC, class 1 expression, and uh, PDL1. If the tumor happens to mutate or get rid of the expression of JAK1 and JAK2, or, or one of them, there will be this uh, pathway will uh, stop. And that's precisely what Tony Rivas reported in several patients with acquired resistance to PD-1 blockade in melanoma. And I'm going to tell you a little bit a particular observation that we are proud of in our institution, which is using uh, interleukin-8 as a biomarker. We recently published several papers in clinical cancer research and analysis of oncology about it. Um, the interesting thing is that IL-8 is produced mainly by malignant cells, and in the cancer, uh, in the cancer patient peripheral blood, often you can detect high levels of IL-8, which is a chemokine that attracts uh, myeloid cells, particularly neutrophils, to the tissue where it is being produced. Um, interestingly enough, if you sinograft a, 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 a mice with um, a tumors, with human tumors, uh, immunodeficient mice, of course, what, what happens is that the human tumor produces ILA that you can detect in the peripheral blood. But interestingly enough, this gene is not conserved in rodents in such a way that all the ILA you measure comes from the tumor. And as long as the tumor grows, you start detecting more and more ILA. And if you perform a surgery and remove the tumor, the ILA levels uh, uh, drop. So you can use this as a surrogate marker for tumor volume. And this actually works as that. So the patients with heavy burden have more IL-8 than those uh, who do not have a, a heavy burden. But more importantly, what we found is that patients who were treated with PD-1 blocking agents, if uh, they eventually responded, we see a decrease in IL levels as opposed uh, who do, to, to, to the 
uh, peripheral blood samples of those patients who do not uh, benefit from treatment and, and the disease progressed. And this was true in melanoma, in non-small cell lung cancer, also in hepatocellular carcinoma. Interestingly enough, if the uh, parameter that you measure is not the absolute value of the concentration, but uh, instead of that, the change, whether it goes up or goes down, then the predictive value becomes quite reliable. And although these series of patients are not that uh, large, this is being prospectively validated in large uh, serum collections. And of course, this is not a predictive biomarker because you assess it, assess it uh, uh, four weeks after, four or three weeks after uh, starting treatment. But don't forget that we very badly need this kind of biomarkers early on treatment so we can save uh, a cost, we can save uh, um, side effects, and, and also uh, we can uh, save time in order to get another line of treatment to the patient early on uh, uh, if we uh, uh, already can define the patient er uh, early on and probably go to another clinical trial or whatever other therapeutic uh, option. Another interesting thing is that in immunotherapy, as you have learned in uh, previous talks, uh, it's a uh, um, uh, um, treatment modality that can result in what we call pseudoprogression due to tumor inflammation that by imaging techniques is wrongly interpreted as a, a, a tumor progression while what is really happening is an immune response. This is not that frequent, but often is the case that uh, uh, you doubt on the first uh, attack, uh, uh, on the first CT scan, that the patient is not, um, is not uh, uh, responding. So uh, in, in this case, what we found is that IL-8 seems to be good at uh, telling apart those cases of true progression versus, uh, uh, um, versus pseudo-progression, as uh, happened, for example, in this case of a patient with bladder cancer uh, uh, treated uh, with um, uh, atezolizumab. Again, this correlates with survival following uh, treatment. So, to sum up, uh, antigenicity, immunogenicity uh, by proper antigen presenting cells, presence of mechanism of immune escape in the tumor, presence of T cell infiltrates, pretreatment, and immune signatures, particularly those related to interferon gamma expression at the tumor tissue, are supposed to be the main ones we are using, which we are going to rely on from a practical point of view. Uh, bear in mind that PDL1. Uh, determination in tumor tissue as a single parameter is not good enough, although it's helpful and, and probably will let us stratify patients very well in clinical trials. And, and certainly we are going to go to this multi-parameter type of scores, including uh, the, the tumor PDL1 stages, but not only. And probably we will have to go to more quantitative measures rather than just uh, the uh, uh, expression the number uh, or the proportion of tumor cells expressing PDL1 on the surface. So now we are going to switch years and we are going to speak about a immunotherapy of renal cell carcinoma. As you know, this is a, a terrible malignancy. It's very often diagnosed in an advanced stage and, and um, it's a, a tumor which is immensely vascularized. It's a tumor with the hypoxia signal on most of the time and it has uh, many vessels in, in its uh, microenvironment. Um, it is a very interesting tumor because in, in the previous part of my talk, uh, I mentioned to you that there was a tendency in the sense that those tumors, uh, which have uh, an important number of T lymphocytes, pretreatment on them, tend to be uh, those uh, which respond to immunotherapy and those with a better prognosis. Actually, in some tumors like colon cancer or ovarian cancer, this is an incredibly good prognostic factor. But in renal cell carcinoma, for whatever reason that we don't know, things are actually the other way around. Those tumors with a, a, a kind of denser uh, T cell infiltrate of T cells producing interferon gamma fare worse in terms of prognosis. We don't know that, we, we don't know the reason for that, but it's something that will make uh, this tumor kind of peculiar and interesting with regard to immunotherapy. However, 
when uh, the first antibody against PD-1 got into development in a landmark phase one clinical trial, uh, in Evolumab, uh, disclosed its very first data, it became very clear that this was a tumor that was amenable to immunotherapy with uh, an important number of patients developing resist uh, uh, responses uh, uh, to treatment in the different dose uh, level cohorts of, the, of these phase one uh, uh, B clinical trials. And importantly, responses when they did occur tended to be uh, uh, durable. In a way, uh, uh, this was one of the tumors that was selected uh, together with um, m m uh, melanoma, uh, metastatic melanoma, and with uh, uh, non-small cell lung cancer because there was previous evidence of uh, a response to immunotherapy. Actually, uh, treatment with uh, high-dose IL-2 and with interferon had shown signs of clinical activity and, and even gave rise to uh, approvals in this uh, disease setting. Prompted by these results, uh, there was a phase two trial, was a randomized phase two trial testing three different dose levels in a randomized fashion, and patients uh, we are, were treated until progression of or intolerable toxicity. I, I will tell you later what, why that's important. And then uh, uh, there were very strong signs of uh, long survival, medians of uh, survival uh, beyond two years. And in, in the three dose levels, but I must tell you that in these uh, 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 three dose levels, uh, probably we are achieving full receptor occupancy, at least in peripheral blood. So uh, uh, these data were uh, really, really encouraging in second line uh, um, uh, metastatic renal cell carcinoma. Uh, hence, a phase three uh, pivotal trial was designed by uh, the same company uh, and, and, and was launched testing Evolumab in second line treat treatment of uh, metastatic renal cell carcinoma in comparison to the most often used uh, uh, second line treatment, which is the uh, mTOR inhibitor uh, Everolimus. And the primary endpoint was uh, uh, overall survival. Interestingly enough, there was a, a good number of patients going up to 25% uh, of these patients who experienced uh, responses by resist 1.1 uh, uh, criteria which was uh, uh, really encouraging. Actually, uh, uh, this um, uh, 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 clinical trial was halted by uh, the disease monitoring committee because of superiority uh, of treatment. And actually, the responses, when they occur, tended uh, to be durable, with many of them ongoing at the time uh, of analysis, and clearly superior to Everolimus. The curves, uh, the, the kaplan major curves uh, the, uh, depicting survival uh, were uh, uh, very interesting for second line, although I must say that we were surprised by not seeing a plateau of patients uh, 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 of the curve eventually uh, talking about a very long-term uh, patients benefiting uh, from treatment. Um, Nonetheless, this is a clear uh, positive phase three uh, clinical trial. Although, importantly, it would have been missed if progression-free survival would have been used as the uh, uh, primary endpoint, since no difference was seen there. So a lot of patients were developing stable disease, and that was probably part of the reason of the extended uh, survival. Uh, from the point of view of uh, the waterfall plots, you can see that this is really interesting for patients uh, with metastatic renal cell carcinoma with a slow progression or uh, tumor shrinkages as, the shrink shrinkages as the best response that were not, um, that, 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 that would be uh, underestimated by the overall response rate. In fact, another very important info, I, I, I observation were, was made is that uh, some of the patients were treated uh, beyond progression and some of them were not. And when you dichotomize for these patients, it looks like uh, treatment with uh, PD-1 blockade 
the giant, the the time, the point, the uh, the point of time when uh, uh, radiologic uh, radiology progression was uh, called uh, benefited the patients, as you can see in this comparison. From the point of view of safety, there is nothing really to add to what you have already seen in other presentations of uh, immunotherapy. And uh, um, uh, in fact, uh, probably there was a, a better uh, tolerability in many uh, of these patients, perhaps with pneumonitis being the side effect uh, that uh, we are uh, more, uh, uh, more fearsome in the, uh, in, the, in the cases that were treated in this pivoted trial with more than 400 patients treated in the nivolumab arm. So following this pivotal trial, this is the scenario of how we guide treatment of uh, metastatic uh, or uh, locally advanced um, uh, renal cell carcinoma that is not surgically amenable. Uh, first line of treatment uh, uh, has several options, including importantly clinical trials, and more importantly so clinical trials of immunotherapy. But now we have sufficient degree of evidence to indicate nivolumab as a, a, a second line treatment. Uh, we, we don't know yet if it's better to, to use it in, in any other disease setting, but uh, certainly it's uh, useful in second line um, uh, uh, treatment of renal cell carcinoma. Atezolizumab as a PDL1 blocker has already been tested in um, a phase one, two clinical trials for renal cell carcinoma. As, as you can uh, uh, see here, there is activity um, going to um, uh, a, a nice uh, uh, a response rate that, uh, interestingly enough, um, uh, uh, seems to uh, 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 not to correlate with the real degree of PDL1 expression in the tumor. It's a very, very, very a, a small uh, a correlation. Importantly, uh, uh, patients treated tend to survive uh, uh, very much. I mean, these curves for uh, second line renal cell carcinoma are truly interesting, although uh, we don't have uh, 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 comparative clinical trials yet. Uh, immunotherapy with anti-CTLA-4 antibodies, in, in, in this case with ipilimumab, uh, has also signs of uh, clinical activity, and, and, and uh, uh, there are cases who uh, uh, responded to um, um, uh, uh, this uh, CTLA-4 blockade, although they were, they were a, a minority. However, this was the clue to start combining uh, um, 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 uh, this drug uh, in several settings. Uh, in fact, uh, ipilimumab is being combined with nivolumab in a multi-arm uh, clinical trial, which is extremely, extremely interesting. And even in this kind of phase one, phase two setting, it's clear that uh, seeing responses that go up to 40% uh, uh, of the patients is nothing that has been seen before in the treatment of second line metastatic renal cell carcinoma. Um, another uh, thing to consider is that vascular endothelial growth factor that many of us have uh, studied very well as the main driver of uh, tumor uh, angiogenesis and vasculogenesis is probably uh, also a very important immune suppressor. Uh, there is plenty of evidence that abundant BGF uh, presence in the tumor microenvironment actually decreases the level of uh, immune cell infiltrates in the tumor and their function. Um, in early uh, uh, observation, it was found that uh, atezolizumab plus the, the BGF uh, blocking antibody bevacizumab has activity that looks promising uh, and potentially uh, giving rise to synergy in metastatic uh, renal cell carcinoma. And, and in this trial, it was very interesting to see that when, a B, uh, when vascular endothelial growth factor uh, was blocked, there was a more prominent infiltration of T cells in the tumor with higher levels of expression of MHC class 1 molecule uh, and PDL1, probably as a result of local release of interferon gamma. And thereby, 
it looks like uh, there is um, synergistic activity when using uh, inhibitors of uh, the BGF uh, uh, receptors, uh, type 1 and 2, uh, uh, together with um, uh, 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 um, the different agents blocking um, PD-1, PD-L1, such as nivolumab, abelumab, pembrolizumab, um, uh, in this case, uh, using different compounds known to inhibit the uh, tyrosine kinase activity of these BGF receptors. Uh, therefore, this is really an interesting option to be uh, further explored in, uh, in this disease. And in fact, there are many ongoing clinical trials testing immunotherapy in first-line renal cell carcinoma. Some of them are already full, fully occurred in such a way that we are expecting results uh, soon, and it could be the case that some of, uh, of these combinations, uh, remember that antiangiogenic compounds are the um, currently most used um, uh, uh, um, uh, treatments in uh, first-line uh, uh, renal cell carcinoma, but uh, all these uh, um, uh, trials are, um, are uh, really addressing the point of seeing whether in first-line uh, addition of PD-1, PD-L1 blocking agents would uh, make, um, uh, uh, would give rise in a comparative fashion to a better outcome. Remember, uh, we are at the beginning. Uh, this is uh, really the beginning of clinical exploitation of immunotherapy. We are uh, in very much, uh, we are in, a, in, in very much in need of uh, good biomarkers. And we certainly expect uh, progress soon in renal cell carcinoma immunotherapy, although, as you've seen, uh, there is a strong case for using this treatment modality in uh, the second-line setting. I hope that during the talk I, I, I stress enough that we are at the beginning. This is not the end, probably, and, and this is not even the beginning of the end. And, and, and to guide us, we are very much in need of uh, biomarkers, particularly predictive biomarkers. And, and then the second message to take home is that we expect progress in uh, renal cell carcinoma immunotherapy in the very near future, um, also in the direction of biomarkers as well. And, um, but uh, as you've seen, uh, there is a very strong case for using immunotherapy uh, with nivolumab in uh, the second line uh, setting. So thank you very much for your kind attention and uh, the take-home messages as that are that we are at the beginning of something rather than at the end of something or even at the beginning of the end of something. And, and immunotherapy is uh, here to stay and it's in very bad need of uh, biomarkers, particularly predictive biomarkers as we've seen uh, during this talk. And then an important message is that expect progress soon in renal cell carcinoma immunotherapy. Um, it is um, really uh, something that is going to come in the near, in the near future. But uh, remember that it's already reality uh, in the case of nivolumab for second line treatment of renal cell carcinoma in a metastatic stage where it has uh, uh, um, uh, a, a very profound effect. So thank you again for your attention, and I will leave you now with the next program, uh, which is efficacy and safety of immune checkpoint inhibitors in non-small cell lung cancer. This has been a revolution of the PD-1, PD-L1 pathway as well. Uh, this lecture will be given by Dr. Peter Schmid. Thank you very much.